First of all, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, it's been some, uh, some very interesting presentations already. I uh, really enjoyed uh, both of the talks uh, and, and some great conversation in the break about how are we going to foster innovation? Where do these ideas come from? I think there's, I'm, I'm going to talk about this idea of closing the technology gap. And I'll, uh, I'll elaborate on, on what that means and, and my view of that. And also how in doing so we can at the same time close the budget gap which uh, you know, the, the unfortunate reality that, that we are all living in is there's a massive budget gap, you know, both at the, uh, at the federal level and then uh, at the state and local level as well. As a, as a resident of California, I can tell you we, uh, we have these challenges everywhere, as, as you know and read about in the news. Um, and, and I think an interesting observation is that it's not just about efficiency anymore. The last decade or so, when we think about technology in the workplace, a lot of what we talk about is driving efficiency. How can we perform the set of tasks that we need to perform faster, better, cheaper? Um, and, and that's obviously still important, and that's the budgetary side of this. But as, you, as, you, as I talk through the presentation, we show you some demonstrations of, of technologies. I want to also emphasize what the previous speakers talked about which is this idea of innovation, and it's not just about how can you do it faster, better, cheaper, how can you do it in more innovative ways? How can you bring innovation through technology to help achieve better results, to help achieve breakthrough results in, uh, in, in the mission of government? So, but, but let's start by talking about this idea of a technology gap. So if you look at the progress of computing over the generations, you know, starting back, uh, um, uh, and Stephen talked about, you know, back to, to mainframes and then mini computers in the 80s. You know, obviously in the 90s we moved to the whole client server mode where, uh, where we've been for the, uh, for the last decade or, or two. Um, and now we're kind of progressing into the cloud. And there's an interesting observation that you can make about the adoption of that technology. This technology started, this idea of computing really started in government and in business and in higher education. It had nothing to do with consumer technology. And in fact, it was out of those uh, institutions, out of government technology, as the, the example of GPS is, is a great one, uh, out of educational research, out of business computing, that those things eventually found their way into the consumer environment. Right? If you think back to your own personal experiences, where did you have your first mobile phone? It might have been a government issued a, a work phone. Where did you have your, uh, where did you have high speed internet first? At, at, at your office or at your home? Where did you have your first laptop? Chances are it was a, it was a, a company issued or government issued laptop. But there was an interesting thing that happened somewhere in the late 90s, early 2000 time frame. And you can see the curve here in terms of business technology and consumer technology. Those lines crossed. And now, where we tend to think of and see really new modern technologies, where we th when we think of innovation, we all think about consumer technology. And in a lot of ways, the technology that we have at work, the technology that we have to do our job to complete our mission, is oftentimes sort of the older stuff. And we go, wow, you know, I, I, can, I can pull out my mobile phone and I can you know, find my location in the nearest Starbucks and tweet about it and find out what all my friends are doing and do a video conference right from my mobile phone. And yet, you know, I still have to go down to the supply closet to check out the projector so that I can present something in a conference room at work. And I'm using a laptop running an operating system that was built over a decade ago and a piece of desktop software uh, that, that hasn't changed much in the last five years. Right? And so there's this change that happened that really has created this technology gap between what we have in our consumer lives and what we have in our, in our workplace, no matter what our workplace is. Now, this isn't a, a government-specific phenomenon. It's not a, a, a US phenomenon. It's really a global thing. But that said, it's highly pronounced in the government. Uh, this is a quote from uh, uh, President Obama. You know, many, many government employees will tell you that their kids have better technology in their backpacks and bedrooms than they have at their desks at work. And for those of you who have kids, you know, I have, uh, my oldest is a six-year-old, and she already uses, you know, when I was traveling abroad, she was emailing me, we were doing video conferencing, she knows how to play and, and do things on my phone that I probably haven't quite figured out yet. And, and so unfortunately, this, uh, th this, this statement tends to be true. Um, and so, 
the, the fundamental question that we ask and that I'm going to talk about today is, so what? Well, who, who cares? Why does that matter? You know, as Dave talked about this morning, technology isn't the end. Technology is the means. Uh, technology isn't the goal. It's the tools that we use to get our jobs done. And our thesis, our hypothesis is, if done right, as Dave said, the technology actually becomes invisible. You don't think about the technology. Um, this is a quote from uh, director of OMB uh, just about a year ago saying, closing the IT gap is perhaps the single most important step we can take in creating a more efficient and responsive government. And this goes back to the idea of it's not just efficiency. Yes, cost cutting is important, but how do we use these technologies to serve the citizens to complete our mission uh, uh, to, uh, to drive better public service? So, I believe that there's four areas, and I'm going to talk to you about each of these, in terms of why and how we're going to close this gap. Um, and I'll, I'll go through each of them, but the first is productivity and this idea of how do we get people working together to innovate and, and better serve the mission. Security, right? Whenever we're talking about technology today, top of the news, you know, go, uh, go look at, uh, at the news headlines yesterday, today you'll see uh, discussions around technology security. It's a very big issue. It's a very real issue. We'll talk about the budget side. How can we drive down costs and drive up uh, uh, productivity, drive up uh, capability? And finally, we'll talk about people. Uh, we'll talk about the impact that this has as you bring people into your organization and look to hire uh, and recruit the best people, but also retain them over time. That the technologies that you use actually do matter in terms of how you attract those people. So, that all sounds good. We all would probably agree, yes, there is a technology gap and a budget gap. Uh, yes, we want to close that gap. So the question is how. Um, and it's our thesis, it's my belief, that this new model of cloud computing is the answer. It's not a fad. It's not a trend. It really is the next architectural step in the way we think about technology, the way we think about computing. Um, if, if we were talking a couple years back, um, I'd be talking to you about this is going to take hold. We think this is where things are headed. We see early signs of that. The pace of acceleration of adoption of cloud computing is so rapid that it's not an if or a when. It's happening now. Uh, and so I think the question is more of a how. How are organizations going to adopt this? Um, this was uh, uh, from, from the 25-point uh, implementation plan to reform federal information technology, saying cloud computing brings a wide range of benefits, economical, flexible, fast. Economical, obviously, it's a utility model. You pay for only what you use. You don't buy technology up front, spend five years implementing it, and then hope it works and lasts for the next decade. You continue to consume technology, and the technology that works for you and for your users, you pay for. Flexible. Right? You pay for only what you use, you use only what you need. Uh, the technology is changing so rapidly, and you have the chance to tap into that rapid pace of innovation, and you can change your organization as the technology changes. You're also not tied anymore to one single vendor and one way of doing things. Right? You're not tied to, okay, well, we're going to invest in, in company X, and so we're going to buy all this stuff from company X, and you know, it's not going to be quite the right thing. You can really do you know, what, what in the IT world we used to talk about as a best of breed approach. You can really take the bits and parts and pieces that you need. And chances are, the technology that you use today may be different uh, and, 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 and completely uh, unrelated to the technology you use a year from now. It's changing that fast, but this model allows you to consume it as you need it and take the pieces that are best. And finally, it's fast. Fast on a number of levels. Fast to procure. There you don't have to go through long uh, uh, RFP cycles, fast to deploy. Uh, these things are on-demand services. Right? You can literally be up and running. You know, Dave shared his, uh, his story about working with Adrian at Arizona State. Um, when we turn on a new company today, it's literally the, the deployment times we talk about are weeks, and, and not more than about 12 of them to go from start to finish for a full organizational-wide deployment of a technology. Whereas the same type of deployment would take years in, uh, in, in the past. So I'm going to talk to you about how we can achieve uh, three, these four goals around productivity, uh, people, security, and efficiency through this idea of cloud computing. So the first is uh, productivity. 
And I wanted to frame each of these by talking about what are the challenges that we face and then what are the opportunities we have to, uh, to address those challenges. The main message, if you take away nothing else from this morning's set of discussions, is that to be an effective agency, to, to really pursue your mission, we have to change our mode of thinking from this idea of individual productivity, how do workers get their single job done, to group productivity or team collaboration. It's all about how people work together. You know, I, I joke with, uh, with colleagues, and sort of gone are the days when I get to sit at my desk quietly with the door closed and get work done. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. It hasn't happened to me for a number of years, but that's good because if I were doing that, I don't know what I would actually be doing. My work is interacting, collaborating with development teams, with customers, with partners, um, working on new ideas, thinking about how we can address challenges. It's not about sitting you know, in, in the country, as Stephen Johnson talked about, and isolating myself and hoping the next epiphany comes to me. Right? And so we really need to think about how are we bringing enabling technologies to make that happen. Right? Are we using products that were built a decade ago around this idea of, quote, individual productivity? How can I eke the last amount of efficiency out of each person? And are we adjusting to this idea of group productivity or group collaboration, really building that in from the ground up? Um, second is mobility, right? Mobility, mobility, mobility. Most of you don't have a laptop. In fact, nobody has a laptop. Well, a couple people have laptops in front of them. But you all have computers in front of you. You have iPads, you have Android phones, you have iPhones, et cetera. And chances are, that device that you have in front of you that you're checking your email on, that you're taking notes on, you know, I, I was, uh, while listening to uh, the, the, the last speaker, I went ahead and went online and bought his book and started downloading it on my phone so I can read it on the flight back. Um, you know, those devices you have in front of you are more powerful than the laptop you had in front of you five years ago. And for some of those of you in departments who haven't upped the budget recently, maybe you're more powerful than the laptop you have in front of you now. Um, but the, the things that you can do on those devices and the need to be mobile and have access to information um, is, is so critical. Um, the, I, I've talked a little bit about the way we traditionally collaborate, the way we come together, we, we, we bring a group of people together for a meeting, it's a fixed point in time event, it occurs, people disperse again, that really limits innovation. Um, and so we fundamentally need to change that idea, and, and there's some opportunities to do that. And last but not least, you know, the biggest challenge, I think, is this, this sunk cost view. I, I bet if I, I'm not going to ask you to do it, but I bet if I ask you to raise your hands and say, how many of you are running a system that you know there's a better system out there, it would be much better for your environment, for your, for your group, for your company, for your organization if you adopted that system. It would probably be faster, cheaper, and easier to run that system. But you know what? We invested in this one. We're going to keep at it. Well, that's, that's the state of IT for the most. I see a lot of smiles, so it must have resonated. That's the state of IT for most people. And it's not government exclusively. It's education. It's, it's commercial business. Um, and you spend a lot of money and a lot of effort investing in systems legacy systems, if you will. And the, 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 the troubling part of that is most of these systems aren't core to your mission. Who here is in the email business? OK, Googlers, put your hands down. But other, other than Google, none of you are in the email business, yet you all run an email system, right? Uh, so as an, ex as an example, so you know, you're spending a lot of your time, money, and energy investing in systems that are absolutely critical to your organization fulfilling its mission, but not part of your core mission. And what if you could instead take those dollars and invest them in your core mission? Think about what you could enable from a technology perspective. So I, I talked about it, and I'll use some examples, and then we're actually going to show you some of this. I'm, I'm going to invite a colleague up to do some demonstrations. But you know, when we talk about technology around collaboration and productivity, it's more than trying to bolt on those concepts in existing technology. So, you know, it's not taking the office productivity and the communication technologies and software that you've been using for the last decade and saying, okay, now we're going to add the, the, the collaboration pack uh, onto the side. Uh, it's fundamentally rethinking the architecture and the structure. And the reason we believe that cloud computing is the answer is that when we build applications in the cloud, uh, quote unquote, the important aspect is the data and the application 
are served from the cloud. They're, they're from the server. So that means that I can get access to any of those capabilities and any of that data from any secure device. Right? My data is no longer trapped on this laptop. My application is no longer trapped on this laptop. Now, there's a convenience aspect to that, which is I can pull out my mobile phone. I can bring up you know, this presentation, and I could show it to you over, you know, over, uh, um, over, over lunch. Um, and that's convenient for me. I didn't have to sync it. I didn't have to do any special work. That just works. But there's also a more important aspect to this, which is now if Mike and I want to collaborate on this presentation, which we've been doing along with Dave and Cyrus and Ian, and there's been about 10 of us working on this presentation over the last three days, we can all work on the same version. Every revision is tracked. Uh, when, when, when Dan made a change that I didn't like, I was able to see what change he made, I was able to add some comments, and then I was able to revert it and say, you know what, I didn't really like that change. And we didn't have to worry about who has version 14 of the PowerPoint presentation, because there was no version 14, there was just the version. And so, yeah, it's more efficient, but it's also more effective, because what we got was we got, we didn't get my ideas of what would a good presentation to this audience be. We got literally, what, eight or nine people's ideas all coming together, Ideas, one idea spins another idea, and, and we got that fluidity, we got that hive effect, that swarm effect where we were all working on. Now imagine being able to do the same thing in your environment, where it might not be presentations to audiences, but it might be uh, ideas about how to address a, a, an issue you know, in, in, in your agency, et cetera. So the technology really needs to be built from the ground up with this idea of multiple people, multiple users in mind, and true cloud computing architectures make that possible. Um, that's why we saw, we saw Dave's example earlier of why were you able to build so rapidly a mapping application that tracked different data points. It's because that application was in the cloud. If every user had to download a piece of software in order to participate in that, uh, in that experience, nobody would have done it, right? But all they had to do was point their web browser. They didn't have to get any special software. It was tools that everyone had. They could click a button, add some text, and boom, it was there. And they could all do it at the same time. You know, if I went to try to add a data point to that map, it didn't say, well, could you wait until Dave's finished adding his data point, then you can make your change and check it back in. Like, that, that idea is, uh, is gone. So, you know, having these capabilities, having these real-time collaboration capabilities is not just about some different look and feel. It's a fundamentally different architecture for making this experience possible. We talked about mobile, and I believe in this idea, at Google we talk about mobile first, and it's the idea that mobile is no longer an also ran. You know, if you look back to the the uh, the history, you know, kind of where techno mobile technology got really popular in business uh, and, and in government, you'd have to point at at the BlackBerry and you say, okay, well, BlackBerry made it possible so we could all have our email with us at all times. And if you all remember, the interesting thing about BlackBerry is where they actually didn't start as phones. They were separate email devices. The first BlackBerry I had wasn't a phone. It was just a thing that got email. Right? And then somewhere along the line, they, made it, they added a phone, too, and it was a pretty bad phone, and, and you know what, but no big deal. Uh, and so it became this idea that, well, for executives in an organization, you should have your email with you. And then it wasn't just email. Well, you might as well have your calendar and your contacts. And now we've gotten to the point where that's almost that, you know, sort of expected. In fact, if my email were to stop working on my phone, that would probably matter more to me than if my email stopped working on my desktop, as an example, because I spend so much more time on my phone during the course of a day as I'm going to different meetings and working with people and traveling and whatnot. But now the expectation goes one level up. Can I get access to all my applications and all my data? Right? So it's not just my email and my contacts and my calendar. That's, that's mainstream. That's, that's what I would expect. But if you took your son or daughter and told them they couldn't access Facebook on their phone, what would they do? They'd go crazy. Now, I think what we're going to see in business and in government is that whatever it is your core mission, whatever it is your, your, your core job function, you're going to expect to be able to do that from your mobile device, from your phone, from your tablet. So there's this idea of mobile first. And taking the legacy technologies that we use today and making them work on phones is difficult. Actually, in my, in, my, in my enterprise technology background, I worked on a project where we had this really you know, innovative set of different technologies, which was just the plumbing to get the data from a server out to an end device. 
and it cost tens of millions of dollars for a company to deploy, but you could push a piece of data from the server out to an end device. Now that's commonplace, right? You can get almost anything on your phone, and that's because of this cloud computing model, where it just makes things mobile aware from the beginning. And one of the principles that we're pushing is mobile first, where we're actually designing for the mobile experience, sometimes first, uh, before we worry about the desktop, because more and more people are moving to that experience. For example, I use Google Maps probably a couple times a day, and it's almost always on my phone, because it's, I'm, I'm mobile, I wanna try and find how to get someplace, I wanna find where this, this event was relative to the hotel, et cetera. Didn't use my PC, I use my phone or I use my, uh, my tablet. I talked about this idea of focusing on your core mission, and as you look at sort of the technology architecture, you know, arguably this is more of a architecture uh, of, of the, the, the IT systems that you run, I think it's really important to look and say, well, what are the things that are key to our environment? What are the things that we need to run? You know, do you need to be running collaboration and productivity software? Probably not. I doubt that that's key to, to any of your missions. Uh, do you need to be running communication software? No, hopefully you already outsourced that to phone companies a long time ago. You know, again, going back to the mobile trend, I think it's really interesting that in business, we all deployed our own PBX systems. It was important for us to run our own phone systems, but when mobile phones came out, we didn't decide to go blanket the country with cell phone towers to run our own one of that. It didn't even occur to anybody that you would do that. So why, why is that? Why did, we, why did we do that? Well, because the technology was ready available, it had all the features we need, it made sense to do that. Yet we, most of us probably still run our own PBX systems. Think about that. So, we can, uh, cloud computing vendors, Google being one of them, can provide you technologies that take your investment and take your time and move it away from these commodity uh, applications that all your users need, they're important to run your business, and allow you to focus on your core mission. A great example of that is uh, we recently introduced a product uh, called Google Earth Builder. Now, I assume everybody's heard of Google Earth, right? Yeah, okay. So, a lot of, lot of heads nod. So Google Earth was this crazy idea a few years ago, a, a company out of InQtail called Keyhole that, that Google acquired. And it was this idea of, wow, we could give geospatial visualization of the entire world to the average person over the internet. And that was pretty amazing. And it, and it was kind of this, now, now it seems kind of commonplace. Like, yeah, of course we have that. But you know, just a few years ago, that was pretty amazing. And, and actually, that was the kind of stuff that was only done in government. But Google Earth came out and government organizations continue to run their GIS systems because in some organizations, GIS is the mission, right? That's exactly what you're doing or it's so core to, to what you're doing. But one of the things we heard from a lot of people and, and Stephen mentioned this in his talk is everything seems to have location data. So the ability to do location-based things, whatever that is, whether that's reporting on information, whether that's tracking information, uh, uh, whatever, whatever the, the use case is, there's a lot of geospatial information out there. Yet, standing up a GIS system to take advantage of that geospatial information is tremendously difficult and costly. And so what we did is we said, hey, one of the, one of the engineers, actually one of the product people on my team said, you know, we do this at Google. We ingest a bunch of information. We stylize it, we put it, you know, we do all the, the transforming that you need to do, we put it on a globe and then we serve it out so that you can look at it from your iPhone or from your Android tablet or from your PC and you can get this great 3D view and you can browse the globe and other people put all these data points on. He said, why don't we just take the tools that we use internally and make them available to people externally? You know, productize those tools and then people can build their own globes. So if GIS isn't your core mission, or maybe even if it is now because these tools are getting so sophisticated, you can leave all the heavy lifting of processing all the imagery, doing all the, the, the computer science that's required to make this phenomenon happen, you can leave that to a cloud vendor, and what you get is your data, your imagery, produced in the form of a globe that can be served out either privately and securely to your organization, so if, uh, if you're using it for internal use, or even served out to citizens, right, so that you can provide citizen information. And the neat thing is it can even be an overlay on Google Maps or Google Earth for, on, the, on the consumer side. So it's an example of how the cloud is really taking what used to be a highly proprietary, uh, highly specific set of technology that only the people where this was core to their mission 
uh, uh, could afford and could, could, could take the time to work. And it's really, uh, really standardizing that and making it available to everyone. So now those of you who might be thinking, yeah, we've got some geospatial data, there's actually technology that you can do that in, a really, in really cost effective ways. And a lot of these ideas didn't come directly from internally as well. Back to the story that Dave told about uh, people using this type of technology in, uh, in, in the developing world. So with that, I'd like to invite a colleague, Ian Kelly, up. And, and I figured this was a good time to pause as we talk about some of these ideas around how you can take technology to really drive collaboration, drive innovation, and drive productivity, and show it to you. Because you know, slides are, are, are interesting, but seeing the real thing in, uh, in person can, uh, can have a much more of an impact. So Ian? Alrighty, so my name's Ian Kelly, I'm an engineer. You can probably tell that because I'm not wearing a jacket and I <laughs> didn't get the memo and feel a little bit underdressed today. Um, and so I was given 10 minutes to show things. And if anybody's ever sat through a briefing with me, you know this usually takes a couple hours. So we're gonna go fast. I'm basically gonna cherry pick the things I think are interesting. Um, so this is definitely not kind of a holistic meal. This is more like tapas, right? It's a little sampling of, of things that Google does. It's the appetizer before lunch, Ian. <laughs> Actually, I actually had tapas for dinner last night. Oh, it was okay, delicious. But, so it can be a full meal. Actually. Okay, great. All right, so Google Docs. We've talked about it. I think I'd be shocked if almost everybody here didn't already have a Gmail account, so I'm going to kind of ignore that for now. Google Docs is the thing that really I think I'm most passionate about when Matt talks about productivity. This is one of those spots where you start seeing teams actually interacting and really building a fundamentally new way. Um, so, you know, we have spreadsheets. We have Word documentation. We have presentations. That presentation Matt was doing was actually a Google Doc, so I guess he started the demo early for me, so thank you for that. Um, but Google likes to do things a little bit differently, right? So, you know, we'll start out, we'll add Google search on this so you can actually find things, which is kind of nice. Um, we have spreadsheet tools, we have presentation tools, and to some extent, that's not that interesting, right? That's just a spreadsheet. And like any spreadsheet, I could go in here and I could insert you know, some chart, and I could do a line chart or a bar chart, or you can tell I'm not really a financial analyst. I know there's all kinds of charts and bar charts and stuff. What I think is more interesting is if you start looking at it and saying, I have this data, I have all those computers Google has behind the scenes, can I do more interesting information gathering on that? Can I exploit that information in a better way? And come on, network. <laughs> this is how you know it's a real demo, though, right? <laughs> Otherwise, this would have just already been uh, completely up there. We might have to come back to this one. <laughs> Bear with me, I like this one. Yeah. Alrighty. Um, all right, we'll try a different spreadsheet. That one didn't want to cooperate. Um, when we talk about working as members of teams and collaborating, instead of just having one spreadsheet that we email out and we do that whole versionitis thing and try and figure out who's doing what, you can see over here, we have the ability in Google Docs just to share these things directly. So I've added a couple people who are hiding in the crowd somewhere, um, Seth and Mashad. And I've given them the ability to actually edit this document. So they can come in, they can edit this document with me while I'm in there. And we're no longer doing this back and forth of trying to understand what's the latest version, who changed which cell, how do I stay up all night and get this ready for the briefing for the boss in the morning. So additionally, you can see over here, even Mashad is already in the document. I don't know if you can read that, if it's a little blurry. And I can go over here and I can just even chatter and say, hey guys. So integrating chat, integrating all these communication mediums into one place. I could go in here, and because I'm not very creative, I'm gonna use an example some of you may have seen before. If I put in a state, and then uh, state governors. I can go in here, and I can do this like, look ma, no hands demo, which is my <laughs> favorite kind, because I have typos like you wouldn't believe. You can see, Seth and Mashad can actually go in there and they can fill out the spreadsheet for me. They're both in there. I think Mashad is orange and Seth is that kind of pinky color. And right now, this is, this is teamwork, right? This is people actually working in a document together, actually really accomplishing something. And this isn't something that you can typically do with kind of the traditional things that live on thick clients, right? This is new. This is getting things running on servers that are massively parallel and powerful. And I think, I think one of the other interesting points of this is, and I'm going to talk in a moment about security, but it's also, it's a little counterintuitive, but this model of collaborating both makes it easier for users to share information 
it also makes it significantly more secure to track information. So as you saw, Ian added his colleagues directly and said, you know, this is a private document, only these people can, can use it. What if he wants to you know, take away those rights? He can go right back in and just remove the rights, say, okay, you can't edit anymore because uh, you know, you're, yep. Seth is making crazy changes, we're gonna take Seth out, and now Seth can only view. You can't do that when you email an attachment around, right? Once you hit send, it's gone. And if you send it to the wrong person, well, hopefully they won't look at it and they'll destroy it. Uh, you don't have any control over it. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but one of the other interesting byproducts that we've seen working with government customers specifically who are very concerned about information security is this model actually gives you more control around information, not less. And the users love it. Yep. And so just one other quick note on this one. I don't have access to all of your data sources, and that would have been a heck of a demo if I had. So I used a Google data source. Instead of actually typing in who the governors were, if you can read up there, we're actually doing a lookup against a Google backend system. You could pull this from databases, you could pull this from content management systems, you could pull this from other Google documents, right? The notion is that if this is in a kind of just a document and just a web page, you can do lots of interesting things with web pages. They can pull data from lots of different places. Um, but it doesn't really stop with, doc with spreadsheets because that would be pretty boring. Um, we do this across the suite of products, right? So if I have a Word document, and again, I've invited Mashad and Seth to be my demo buddies here. I could say, you know, does anybody have any ideas for next year's event? And I can just ask them, right? And we can work together on this and maybe say, you know, uh, make the roof not fall <laughs> in. Although I guess that does look a little googly because we're very industrial and, and how we design things. But here we can kind of move back and forth. We can integrate. We can <laughs> um, you get the idea, right? If you, can, if you can type a Word document, you can use a Google document. What you can't do, and this gets even beyond kind of this initial level of social collaboration, is things like social commenting, right? Comments have traditionally just been stuck on the side of a document and then you had it and then they just kind of sat there until somebody deleted them. I can actually go in here put in a comment that's directed to Mashad, it gives her an action and says, uh, your job to work on the weather. This post now is a life cycle of its own. Just by the fact I tagged her in there, that'll show up in her activity streams and her inbox so she can actually work on this, whether she's in the document or not. Right? We're looking at this and saying, how are the different ways people work? And this is, this is a really important point to, to drive home. When I was talking about you know, it's not just about bolting collaboration onto the side of existing technologies. This idea was born out of the observation that the way people interact around a document often translates into email, which is I email you a document as an attachment, you email me back with comments, maybe you put some comments in the document, but then you email it to Ian, Ian puts them in, it gets too messy, we move the conversation to email. Well, when you're actually working in an online document of this nature, you can have the conversation, and instead of it living in your email, the conversation about the document can live alongside the document. As Ian said, it can have a whole workflow of, his own, of its own. And as these comments and discussions are occurring, there's integration with email. So for those of us who are used to the old way of, of doing it in email, it shows up your email, you can respond right from within your email, it goes back into the document. And we've also implemented a lot of the social concepts. So you saw Ian could do an at, and, automatically include a person. It shows up as a discussion thread, which is familiar to, uh, uh, you know, to someone who's using Twitter or Facebook or, or, or other social networking type techniques. So it's really a platform for rethinking the way you're doing a common task, which is writing a document, but doing it in a completely different and, and new way that meets the way that we're actually trying to work today. So I think it's funny you said that we don't bolt anything on the side, because there actually is one case where we do. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody use Word? <laughs> do you wish you could do this kind of thing in Word? We actually have a product called Cloud Connect that lets you do just that. So you'll have to trust me. These are two different computers. They're both hosted. I think they're actually hosted in Atlanta. So you know, who knew? What we've got is the ability to actually go in one document and make some change. And when I save it, what you'll start to see is it's gonna sync it up to the Google infrastructure. And then over here on this side, 
it's still not there, it's still not there. Come on, network. Mm -hmm. It's syncing the changes, and all of a sudden those changes are in that document. Right, so we're, take, we're extending the concept of Google Docs, which is pretty fantastic, and letting people do it in the tools they're already used to. And so this idea was, you know, I talked earlier about that investment that you've made that you just can't get rid of. Well, guess what? We've all made massive investments in Office productivity software. You probably all use some version of Microsoft Office. And that's what your users are familiar with. That's fine. Our view is the cloud can still help. And so as Ian just showed you, we built this plugin that we call Cloud Connect that leverages the Google Cloud, but actually interacts directly with Microsoft Office. So you get some of the benefits that you would get if you were natively in Google Docs, as much as we can try to do with, with desktop software. Uh, from, uh, from your, your existing office investment. Exactly, and I won't harp on it because I'm going to run out of time if I do. The sharing model is the same. I can share with people, I can add access, I can add editors, that sort of thing. It's a completely uh, standardized metaphor across the entire platform. Um, I did want to dip back just briefly though. Damn it. And I think we probably have time in for maybe one or two more things. Okay, <laughs> I'll go speedily then. <laughs> Okay, so Gmail, does anybody not have a Gmail account? Okay, One gotta person. Okay, we've got to get that guy a Gmail account. Fantastic. We'll <laughs> talk after this, you and me. You're all familiar with Gmail. Has anybody played with the chat in here? Maybe that doesn't look all that exciting. Maybe it would be better if we did something like... Does anybody speak Japanese? Perfect. Real-time language translation. This is a fundamentally hard problem. We do it to 58, 59. You're the PM guy, you should know this. <laughs> we do it to most of the spoken languages across the world. Real-time translation, very complicated, doesn't fit on these. We get to do it because of the cloud platform. Um, and so it's just a great example of some of the new ways you can start thinking, right? So Google, uh, a team within Google has built a, a real-time language translation system based on statistical models. We could talk for hours about how that works. But because of these cloud-based systems, we can easily integrate that into any of these products. He could have shown you the same thing in Google Docs, where you can click one button and take a document and have it translated and rendered in any other of, I don't know, some, some number of languages that we support. It's like uh, 48 language like pairs now or something. Like Catalan, there you go. Uh, so it, it's an example of the kinds of things you can start to do in the cloud. And, and really, as, as we said, we're barely scratching the surface here. All right, I have one final point, and then I promise I'll give up the stage. Okay. I keep saying that Google does things slightly differently, and as an engineer, I appreciate that. Um, this is what happens if you give three engineers in multiple different offices across the country some time. This is about 400 some odd slides. I'm an engineer, I can talk fast. And so off we go. And maybe you're not gonna use this to make your own animations, but the notion is that if you're working in an environment where people can collaborate, they can work together, regardless of where they physically are, they're not worried about this whole question of how do I manage versions, how do I tie this back together at the end, you can do some pretty remarkable things. Um, and so this was, I guess, three guys across the country, three days. I'm almost there, I promise. <laughs> We're like 360 slides. Can I finish the last six? All right, that's it for me. Thanks, Good Ian. luck. So I think that's some, hopefully we showed you some good examples of, of uh, collaborative technologies to start making that, those, those ideas that we talked about in slides feel, uh, look and feel real. Um, there are other areas that we want to talk about, um, and, and being cognizant of time, I'll make sure we, we go through quickly. Um, there we go, thanks. Um, second area that I want to talk about is people. Um, so, and this one's really simple which is one of your goals, uh, one of your jobs as executives within government organizations is to go bring the best and the brightest, the new talent, and get them to want to work with you and for you to help uh, in public service and help fulfill your mission. Whether, whether you be technical talent, uh, public policy talent, uh, medical talent, whatever the case may be, one of your key jobs is to recruit and retain people. But that's becoming more and more challenging today, right? Because there's so many opportunities for young people coming out of university, coming out of, uh, of, of various, uh, coming out of the military, coming out of uh, various organizations. And so how do you get those people? Um, how do you help them want to come to your organization? How do you give them the tools that they need and expect to do their job? 
you know, the opportunities that we have, I think, is we, we talk about these people as digital natives and now cloud natives, where they don't know anything but cloud, right? When you talk about, uh, you know, uh, having this conversation with a, a kid that started at Google recently, and I was talking about Microsoft Outlook, and he kind of looked at me, and he had heard of it, but he had never used it. And that was just mind-boggling to me. I'm like, what do you mean you've never used my, and he said, I have never had an email, I've never had an email application. He's like, I've always used an email service, right? I used Hotmail, and then when Gmail came out, I used Gmail, and then the school that I just graduated from has been using Google Apps for the last three years. Um, so it really is thinking about the profile of those people that you're looking to uh, re recruit and retain. And then there's also this idea of how can you help, how can you give your people technology that doesn't get in their way, that really becomes invisible and makes their lives better instead of them fighting with their technology. Right? How can you let them use their iPhone at work, uh, et cetera, and giving them that choice? So, you know, when you think about the technology, now obviously the technology that you use to run your business is not the only thing that, that's going to tell you whether or not you're going to be able to grab, you know, this is the 2010 graduating class at Harvard. It's obviously not the only thing, but more and more it's one of the elements, and it, it really helps establish the cultural feel that's going to help decide if you're able to not only recruit, but also retain, right? Because it helps shape the overall opportunity. And Dave talked a little bit about this idea, but we're moving to a model of user choice. You know, and I, I put the picture of the iPhone up here because I think the iPhone was really transformative in the way we think about technology in our lives, right? Walk down the street, uh, down here on, on H or K Street, and every other person is walking like this. Right? Because they all have a smartphone and they're all doing something interesting. Now we could talk about socially whether that's good or bad, but the reality is it's, the game has changed. And so you know, this is what people expect. And so moving to a model of user-based choice where users get to choose not only their devices that they're going to use or their laptops that they're going to use, but even the services that they're going to use to perform their work function. That's the model that we're trending towards. Let's talk about security. Because usually when we have this, everybody says, yeah, that all looks great. I want the mobility. I want the cool application functionality. But security is sort of the elephant in the room. Security is the thing that you can't get by. Say, so, well, the cloud's not secure. Um, quite the opposite. Right? When you look at the computing architectures that you're using today, they're fundamentally flawed when you bring them into today's world of network connectivity. Right? The operating systems that we all still predominantly use were not built with connectivity in mind. Right? They're built around this nice, isolated little environment that you don't put things on or take things off very often. They're fundamentally flawed. Whereas the web, as an operating system, was built with security in mind. Right? It was built with this idea of isolation. It was built with this idea of accountability. And so having the security models that actually work um, right? we, we joke about Patch Tuesday, right? the, soft, the installed software that you have where you have to uh, install patches every week to take care of the next security vulnerability. Whereas the opportunity in the cloud is, yeah, those patches still have to be installed, but when we install a patch, none of you have to do anything. In fact, you don't even know that we did it. The system just gets more secure. Now, that's not to say that it's perfect, right? No system is perfect. And there's actually a panel this afternoon with one of our security experts who will probably tell you some, some, maybe some scary stories about uh, some of the things that happen on a daily basis. But as a computing model where you're not keeping data on the device, where you're not trying to keep an end device up to date, it's a much more secure model. Um, the, other, the other aspect around security is this idea of continuous innovation. And when you think about security, except for those of you who are in the security field, you probably don't, the word innovation probably doesn't come to mind. But for us, this is an area where we're constantly innovating. Um, so I, I won't bore you with our, our security model, but, but suffice it to say that we really do think about uh, security from the ground up. As Dave said, our, our primary job, our, our first job is protecting users and protecting their data. Uh, it's a multi-layer security model of people, process, and technology, and really from the ground up built to be a secure computing environment. We're continuously innovating in that space. Uh, you know, we, were the, we were the first cloud service to default everything to HTTPS. Uh, we're the first uh, cloud service to achieve FISMA uh, accreditation. Uh, for, uh, for government users, and there's many, many more things. My favorite example is something that we released not too long ago. 
Probably a number of you in your government computing environment have some sort of secure token ID as a secondary authentication mechanism, right? Uh, because that's what a lot of large government agencies and corporations do. Well, we said, you know, that's a really good thing because one of the biggest problems with security on the web are usernames and passwords. And the real problem is the fact that we all do it. You use not sophisticated enough passwords and you use the same one a lot of places so you can remember them, right? And so we said, wow, wouldn't it be cool if you could have that two-factor authentication and it could work across all, all our apps? And so we did that, and then we said, well, wait, you know, this is good for businesses, but wouldn't it be great if we could just make this for, for all users? So we now have, across all Google users, consumers and businesses, two-factor authentication, where your second factor happens to be that thing that most of you carry around, which is a smartphone. And if you don't carry a smartphone, if you carry one of those old flip phones, that can still work because we can send you your second factor in real time over SMS. So now we've given every user in the entire world that uses a Google service for free strong two-factor authentication akin to what only the largest companies and the largest government agencies in the world could have. So it's an area where we think we can provide as a cloud service stronger and better security than what's traditionally available. Um, and, and Obviously, in, in, uh, for, for, for you all, you know, we're very focused on government, as I said, uh, FISMA. We announced uh, a couple years back our Google Apps for Government, so a segregated cloud specifically for government users to meet the unique needs of government, and even going so far as meeting the uh, government requirements around background checks, so background checking all of our individuals uh, that, that have access to these systems to meet government requirements. But there's one other thing we're doing around kind of computing in the security model. And as I said, the, the, the predominant model of today is a very flawed architecture. And so we're working on this new concept that we refer to as Chrome OS. And I want to invite my colleague Cyrus Mystery up to uh, talk about uh, our Chrome OS initiative. Cyrus? Thanks, Matt. So um, Chrome and Chrome OS, have you guys, how many of you use Chrome or have you? And what do, you, uh, what do you normally like about Chrome? Yes, we get that. <laughs> That's the first one people say. It's really, really fast. Um, the reason we made Chrome actually was uh, for several reasons. Uh, speed was one. We couldn't make apps fast enough, rich enough. We actually looked at all of the Google applications and people are living in the browser. They're doing everything they want in the browser. One of the fundamental problems was the browser itself was getting in the way of the speed of our apps. Uh, the second thing that was getting in the way was the actual speed of the bandwidth, and so we spun up an effort called Google Fiber to actually run gigabit uh, speeds to homes uh, and cities. You guys probably heard about that in the news. And then there was another fundamental problem, right? We'd fix the browser, get the bandwidth to them, and we said, there's this whole operating system around it, right, with bouncing balls and updates and viruses and, you know, 45 seconds to boot on the fastest one and, uh, and upgrades and patches and you know, it's this huge problem. And so we said, what if we completely rethought it? What if, if for the people that can really live online, now that you can do almost everything you possibly do online, uh, what if we made an ultra secure operating system that was just the web? Right, and that's fundamentally what we did. Um, you know, why is it so secure? I have, I think, about three minutes. Uh, but it's very, very secure for a lot of reasons. For those of you that know why Chrome is so secure, it was com we had the benefit of writing it much, much later than all the other browsers, right? We weren't plagued with a lot of what they have to deal with. Um, so fundamentally, we don't trust anything, right? Those of you that are in the security world know that that's the best uh, way to run security. Um, we sandbox absolutely everything. Every tab is sandboxed separately. Uh, no web application or website can affect another tab. Um, and then when we, when we said, let's, what about Chrome OS? How can we take this one step further? We said, what if we sandbox every tab, and then we sandbox the entire browser, which is the only application, so that it itself cannot talk to the operating system. Um, for those of you that are running a different type of operating system, you may or may not know that when you install an application, it becomes a super user, right? It can do whatever it wants. It can write to the registry. It basically has free reign on the computer. Uh, that very large connection between the application and the operating system is the problem. Of course, it's very, very easy to use. Um, we've had, we now have uh, tens of thousands of Chromebooks uh, in the hands of users, and we've never had to train anyone. 
uh, from a grandmother to a six-year-old, um, we never had to train a single one. And the reason is when they boot it, uh, it's just a browser. And everyone knows how to you know, type in the line and the forward and back buttons. Uh, very easy to manage, right? Because this is a cloud device, meaning it's just the web, uh, there's no, you don't need on-premise stuff, right? You don't need you know, group policy and registry settings and all the stuff that goes with that. Um, it's much less expensive, we'll cover that in a second. And of course it works offline. I mean, there are situations where you are, you know, not just in New York subway, but you are in rural areas or other countries or places where bandwidth isn't always there. And so HTML5 luckily is fully capable of offline. Um, I'm often called the gadget guy, uh, Matt used to be. Uh, but I will get to show you, um, who has seen a Chromebook by the way, just curious. So you guys will get to see them uh, upstairs and play with these. Uh, this was actually the very first original one. Um, who has one, by the way? Just curious. Okay, good. Um, what I just did, by the way, I just lifted the lid. We even take things, and uh, you know, we take the simplest thing and say, why, if you lift the lid, just turn it on. By the way, that just booted. Um, that's about seven seconds. Uh, the new one that I'm gonna show you uh, boots in about uh, six seconds, which is pretty exciting. Um, and boot and connected, meaning you are fully online. Um, we said, you know, we, the simplest things we did, you know, when you lift the lid, why not just turn it on? Why make you search for the button, right? We l literally took every aspect of this and said, let's make it very, very easy and secure for people to get online. Um, so you guys want to see? You want to see some, how it looks, how it works? Does it only look like only 20% or so uh, had seen it? Um, oh, we're already here. Well, this is my favorite website that I like to go to on a rainy day. <laughs> I like to go to the IRS and just kind of look around. What do, they, what do they feel like doing to me uh, this month? Um, but you might be thinking, okay, this is great. This is the web. What happens? You know, what happens, if I, what happens if I legitimately go to something? By the way, that just launched a full PDF um, in under a second. This can actually launch a 10,000-page PDF um, in under a second as well because we wrote, um, you know, an embedded PDF view right in there. So that, you know, if you touch those types of applications um, and those types of documents that need that, for instance, you might be searching on Google um, home sales in Virginia and you might have, let's see if we can find one here, you might have a PowerPoint file and you might say, well, how will that work, right? Will I be able to see a PowerPoint file? And yes, you can, right? You can view that full thing right within Chrome. What you're actually seeing here uh, is I, I dove right in, right? It's just a browser. When you log in, you are, in a browser. It's a fully stateless device, which means wherever I go, everything is synced, right? So no matter what happens. There's also some fun stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen the full power of HTML5. I'm not gonna show it now, but if you go to lucidchart.com, a really good example of really, really powerful stuff that you can do online. I mean, we're talking Visio, very, very rich stuff. Um, I love showing this. Uh, this is actually, for those of you that, you know, I know you're gonna hear, well, all right, this application only runs on IE6. Okay, and this is the one. Um, you can actually run that, right? And you can run Internet Explorer um, or Firefox or anything, you know, right within your browser. Citrix announced at Synergy uh, two weeks ago an HTML5 version. I mean, this just shows you the power of HTML5. We are literally running, you know, an entire Windows operating system on a completely secure, stateless client device. And when you think about what that means, uh, it's truly amazing. Why is this so interesting? If we can switch back for just a second. Um, the reason this becomes so interesting, we go here, oh good, nice, thank you. Um, the reason this becomes so interesting is because this is what it currently costs a company per year uh, to run a traditional machine. By the way, this number, when I first saw it, I was that there's absolutely no way in the world this is true. Um, the, we, we, Gartner actually releases a Gartner number, um, released this last year. If you actually do the math, the absolute most well-managed, most secure lockdown, you cannot do anything, and we may or may not let you type your name in machine, um, mm -hmm. costs $3,000 a year to manage. And by the way, for those of you that don't believe me, literally take, you know, spend a day, it's probably the best homework assignment you'll ever do, to just run the analysis on how much it costs. And you can actually see more than half of the cost is actually user cost, but even if you strip that out, it's a very, very, it's almost $2,000 a year in actual real hard cost. Forget the user cost of how much time, oh God, the computer went down and everyone's on a long coffee break and just wander around, right? Or, you know, <laughs> oh, how much did I lose? And you have that look of terror in your face because you lost all that work. Um, if you lose this, you know, throw it out the window, get a new one, put it on your desk and you're exactly where you left off. So, um, you know, 
the stuff that's in here, Matt's already covered. I'm not going to go into why it's so expensive. Uh, the short story is it's just a lot, a lot of manpower and a lot of work to keep traditional machines running. Um, one company told me, this is a true story, and if you do the math on this, it's interesting too. It's going to take, the, it's going to cost them 500,000 man hours to migrate their company from Windows XP to Windows 7. And another CIO actually said, that's nothing. We did the math on our 200,000 person organization. It will be a million man. And, and actually, these numbers are staggering. And they're actually real when you do the math. It's actually not a lot of man, man hours per machine. But it just adds up, and this is how much it costs. And the sad part is they said, after I've done all that, there's no value. Right? I haven't changed my business fundamentally in any way. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to do, is we also want to change the business model entirely and come up with a whole new way of, uh, of computing at, at literally less than a dollar a day. You get a computer, all the cloud management features, and everything. So a radically new way to even procure these uh, and to go about uh, in this computing model. So Great. thank you very much. Thank you, Cyrus. So that's a good segue. Yeah, we can clap for that. I <laughs> that's a good segue, and we've only got a few minutes left. but. You know, at the end of the day, there is a bottom line. And this model that we're talking about in the cloud is really significantly cheaper, right? I don't, have to, I don't even have to talk about the challenges. We all have them in terms of budgets are tightening uh, at, at every level. And as Cyrus said, more and more of our money is being spent for un, unknown benefit, right? Eight out of, there's a Gartner number also that says eight out of $10 in IT are just for keeping the lights on. No improvement in functionality, et cetera. Just, just keeping things on and safe uh, for, uh, for users. Now imagine if you could flip that around and say, I'm going to spend 80% of my dollars on making my users' lives better and increasing their capability to, uh, to, to approach the mission of, of, of your organization. Um, you know, if you look at what some of our customers are seeing, uh, both, both uh, and I'll let you, you look, you know, City of Orlando, uh, email costs by 60%. State of Wyoming, saving taxpayers over a million dollars annually. Uh, City of Los Angeles, five million in savings over, uh, over five years. So there's really a lot of budgetary benefits to be had here. There's also the predictability, right, which is you're buying this as a service. Uh, you're, you're paying for only what you use, and so you can decide how much or how little you want to use, and that can change, right? Back to the flexibility point. In lean times, you can lean it down, right? When you have to let go of that temporary workforce for three months because you can't afford them, you don't have to pay for those 10,000 seats uh, that, that you would in a, in a traditional environment. Um, so we have a ton of momentum. Uh, in, uh, in government, both uh, federal as well as state and local. Uh, we announced a half a dozen additional uh, customers today uh, on our blog in terms of new customers that are moving to, uh, to Google. The city of Des Moines in, uh, in Iowa is one of those. I have 1,900 uh, uh, employees uh, that they're moving to, uh, to Google Apps. Uh, uh, and I, I wrote a couple of these down. South Carolina, the Department of Health and the Environment, 4,200 employees that they're moving. So, it really is, as I said, if we were talking a few years back, I'd say, ah, this is a trend that will start. Um, a lot's happened in a few years, and this is a, this is a freight train that's, uh, that, that's moving fast down the track, uh, and, uh, and a lot of, a lot of uh, momentum, especially in the government environment, where we think the, the impacts can be, uh, can be some of the largest. So uh, with that, I want, to, uh, I want to wrap up. I thank you very much for, uh, uh, for your time and attention. Hopefully, you found this. Uh, this interesting, you know, my, my closing message to you is, you know, we all know that there's this big gap here from a technology perspective. Um, I believe that the technologies in cloud computing can really help you close that gap to achieve that productivity and innovation, to really drive the teamwork uh, that we're all striving for, um, to drive simplicity and affordability to help at the same time close the budget gap. And, uh, and, and you, there are vendors out there, Google as well as others, that have now what, what, what are no longer early adopter or risky solutions, but really uh, proven solutions in, uh, in cloud computing.